On BBC One in the West now, it's time for the Sunday Politics with David Garmston. Good morning and welcome. This week, farming, Brexit and the Prime Minister. Coming up in the next half an hour, working the land. West Country farmers have been told what support they'll get after Brexit. So are they still keen on leaving the EU? And it's the Tory conference. As Conservatives gather in Birmingham, one West Country MP predicts as many as 80 backbenchers may vote against Chequers. All that, and I've been speaking to the Prime Minister as well. Joining me in the studio this morning are my guests. They are Julie Girling, one of the South West's Euro MPs. She was a Conservative. She's now sitting as an Independent. She'll be telling us why. I'm also joined by David Drew, the Labour MP for Stroud. Welcome to you both. We'll hear from you uh, in just a moment or two. But first, as you know, how are West Country Tories uh, shaping up in Birmingham as Theresa May fights for her vision of Brexit and her own political future? Let's uh, find out with Paul Baltrop, who is at the Tory conference. The Conservatives are gathering here in Birmingham for what could be a difficult few days. In six months' time, we'll be out of the European Union. And no one here can tell us exactly what that'll be like. The Prime Minister has this morning been trying to shore up support for her troubled Chequers plan. It's not just unpopular in Europe, it's also been widely condemned by many of her own MPs. Some of the most stinging criticisms have come from West Country colleagues. That, not surprisingly, leaves the public pretty unimpressed. They are the real opposition. Brexiteers like Jacob Rees-Mogg putting forward their ideas for how we leave the EU. In public, they promote alternatives to Chequers. In private, they're more blunt. At home in North Wiltshire, MP James Gray predicts humiliating defeat if Theresa May's deal comes before MPs. Chequers, or anything that looks like it, or certainly that's worse than it, would be worse than remaining in the EU. So I think Chequers is completely and utterly hopeless. There are two or three things in it which also which are unworkable. Uh, in my view. So Chequers, I think, is dead in the water. Absolutely beats me why the Prime Minister doesn't realise that. There will be maybe, I, don't, I think, 70 or 80 Conservative members of Parliament who will vote against Chequers and therefore it cannot get through Parliament. Westminster has in recent weeks seen increasing speculation about no deal. That outcome horrifies Labour and Liberal Democrat MPs and worries many Conservatives, including some Brexiteers. No deal would not be a success in any way, shape or form. Uh, the European Union has just completed a comprehensive free trade deal with Canada. For goodness sake, we should surely be able to achieve something at least as good as that. The Prime Minister's met the Canadian leader, knows plenty about their EU deal and insists it won't do. She's sticking with something like checkers. One loyal MP who worked alongside her in the Home Office says she's tough but warns of what lies ahead. Uh, no deal is better than a bad deal, but a good deal is the right outcome. If we're going to get that through Parliament, we've got to get that through on Conservative and DUP votes. And the challenge for the Prime Minister is trying to unite our party for the very important reason that we want to get that deal through, because that is what is better, best for the country. That is not an easy task, and I think we will see a little bit of that at the party conference. It's all a bit of a mess, according to voters we talked to in the Wiltshire town of Chippenham. Atrocious. Yep, not handling it well at all. Just a complete mess. I think it's a bit of a mess at the moment, and it needs sorted out. They're in a bit of a mess. I think they're a little bit confused at the moment. They're just waiting for Brexit to be over, and then they'll get rid of her. One consolation for Theresa May, and disappointment for Labour, the next election needn't be until 2022. Well, winning over voters is for later. For the Prime Minister here in Birmingham, winning over her own colleagues is the immediate challenge. That was uh, Paul Baltrop in uh, Birmingham this morning. With Julie, um, your personal story, you, you won't be there as a Conservative uh, because you are no longer a Conservative. How did that come about? Well, this time last year, just almost exactly uh, a year ago, I voted in the European Parliament to say that I didn't think that the 
um, the negotiations were progressing fast enough. Now, that at the time seemed a matter of fact, and it certainly seems to be true now, doesn't it? Because, so they kicked you out. And for that, apparently that was disloyal, so they took the whip away, and then later on they suspended me from the party for the same reason, and actually just this week they sent me a letter saying you're expelled. You see, my memory of it was that um, they want you, the government wanted to move on to the next state of the, of the negotiations and you voted against that, so you actually voted against the UK and more with the EU. Well, that's certainly what uh, the Prime Minister said in retrospect, but actually at the time, if you remember, the UK government had agreed the timetable of the negotiations, they had agreed exactly the order it would go in, and then suddenly, when they realised that they hadn't achieved a particular milestone, they decided that we needed to pretend we hadn't agreed that. Well, that's not my stamp in politics. If I've agreed something, I stick with it. But they would argue that given the choice between us or backing the UK negotiations and pushing it through, you went with your friends in Brussels. Well, they, they do argue that and it's nonsense. But they've, ex nonsense. they've actually expelled you. I didn't know that. Yes, that's they expelled new. me this week, actually. Maybe it was to stop me going to the conference. So you are an ex-Tory. I am, after nearly 40 years. Well, I mean, if that was happening in the Labour Party, there would be um, all hell to play, wouldn't there? Well, there would be. People would be selected. Well, I, mean, I always believe in a broad church. I mean, we've got our own difficulties over some issues. But the reality is, once you start expelling people for contrived reasons, then you are on a very slippery slope. So um, I don't know if Julian wants to join the Labour Party. Maybe her politics aren't quite the same as mine. Perhaps not with your current leader, uh, uh, But, especially. you know, the reality <laughs> is, once we get into this situation where you're expelling people for principled stands, I mean, I'd never have lasted in the Labour Party. So, so are you, is that what you're saying to your sort of Corbyn supporters there, particularly the, the sort of the, the ones who uh, take to social media? You're saying lay off. I say certainly lay off social media because it does immense harm when you attack people personally. My view of politics has always been stick to the issues, avoid the personalities. And if you stick to the issues, then you have a reasoned debate and you might so get you, something you, out you of it. you don't want to be deselected, is what you're saying. Well, if they deselect me, then that's up to them. But I would much prefer to live my days in the Labour Party. Julia, let's come back to... Because you can now give us a real insight into what they're thinking in Brussels. Do you believe they want to give us a, a deal? I believe that they want to make the leaving, the Britain leaving the EU as smooth as possible. But there is a reality in Brussels that's been there for two years, which doesn't seem to have descended in Whitehall yet or in Westminster, that, that there are two sets of red lines and they can't meet. So how do we achieve that? And we, we haven't had really any movement towards, for they, example, they, the Irish question from the UK government. Brussels hasn't moved an inch, has it? Or a centimetre? It, has for our it hasn't given a centimetre. No, but the Brussels issue is the UK leaving, right? So you leave the 27. So you tell us on what basis you want to leave. She did. She did the Lancaster House speech. That were, you know, the, the, the red lines about the East Jet, and they said, no, that's not possible. We can, we, could, we can do a trade deal with you, and they could have started that two years ago. But no, the, the government insisted that they wanted to have this deep and special relationship, if you remember that phrase, not really knowing what it means. And Brussels kept saying, well, that, you know, we'll do you a seat, we'll do you a, de a, a trade deal, but, but we can't... they're punish, aren't they? I mean, no. they, they, Theresa May goes over there, they pat her on the head, patronise her. Uh, and send her back again with nothing. So you think that they should spend their time covering up for the lack of groundwork that the UK government have done to make her look but it takes, OK uh, in no, public? No, I'm not suggesting anything. It's not my position to, but it, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? It you does. You can't have a negotiation if they just say no. And you have to have what we would call trusted partners. And you can not say at any point that the EU has not been a trusted partner because it's stuck to its guns, whereas the UK has vacillated around and bear in mind they're sitting in Brussels they all speak three four languages they read our papers they see that Boris Johnson is undermining the Prime Minister they see that Michael Gove has been undermining the Prime Minister or until recently uh, they see all of the things that all of the hard Brexiters are saying Liam Fox etc and they know that Britain is not in a state to make a deal and because they we can't rather agree. Deal this, uh, would they rather deal this would they ask you as well David would they rather deal with Mrs May or Mr Corbyn I think they'd rather deal with Mrs May and they'd rather get that done pretty quickly. And Mr Corbyn, I mean, his six tests, he wants all the best bits but none of the worst bits as well. 
Well, I mean, that's negotiation, isn't it? Well, you always start with your own, they're not negotiating. your own strong positions. But, I mean, the reality is those six tests would fit ideally with what the EU wants in terms of the relationship with the but UK. Why could Mr Corbyn persuade them to give a deal that they won't give Mrs May? Because the reality is we're a pro-European party. Now, we may you have elements... Leave. No, I mean, the reality is we've come to, to, a, to a coalescence around a position that we largely want to remain with the EU, we want a different sort of EU, and we want to see a way in which we can build a relationship with the EU. Going out, and then the big worry is now, crashing out with no deal, that will be catastrophic. It won't just affect the UK, it will have a bad effect on the EU well, as well. One, one last word. In a word, will there be a deal or not, do you think? I think it's... Teetering on the edge at 50-50 at the moment, I suspect it's going to get more and more towards no deal. Thank you. Now, coming up later in the show, we'll be getting our wellies on and going down on the farm. How will the countryside change after Brexit? Well, it comes on a week when the National Farmers Union warned that farmers may not be able to export anything to the EU for the first six months after Brexit if we don't get a deal. I talked to the Prime Minister about that in an interview in 10 Downing Street, but I began by asking her about the funding crisis in local government, which has taken Somerset to the edge of bankruptcy. Prime Minister, it's good to see you. Uh, the leader of Somerset County Council, a Conservative, says he can't sleep at night because of the cuts he's had to make through austerity, an emergency budget. Uh, do you care? Over the past few years, local authorities have had some difficult decisions to take, as government has had difficult decisions to take on public spending. But he can't sleep. As we deal, as we deal with the uh, economic mess we were left by the Labour Party and the last Labour government. Uh, Somerset County Council, of course, is getting an increase in its, uh, in its budget this year. And uh, as we look across the uh, local authorities, what we see is uh, local authorities that are delivering the services for the, uh, for the people but in their area. But they're a Conservative uh, authority, and they can't cope. They're on the verge of bankruptcy. What we see from Somerset County Council, of course, is that more money is going into, uh, into Somerset County Council. And uh, as we look across local authorities, what we see is local authorities delivering services with, for their people. Yes, it has been difficult for them, and I recognise that because of decisions that had to be taken in relation to the overall public finances, because we had to sort those finances out when we came, first came into government uh, in 2010, and it has taken some time to do I, that. I did ask you, though, if you cared. I'm not being cheeky, but I just wonder, because he, he says he can't sleep very well because they're now talking about cutting aid to young carers, for example. They haven't yet, but they might. Well, of course, you know, as, as Prime Minister, I care about the services that are provided for people across the country. Uh, and obviously, as Prime Minister, I, look, I have to look at the overall picture in relation to that. You know, as a government, we have recognised the importance of public services. That's why we're putting more money into our schools, more money into our National Health Service, for example. Uh, and that's, uh, that's important. We're able to do that because of the balanced approach we take to our economy. All right, let me move on to Brexit, because I know it's uh, very much in your mind at the moment. It's being reported in some newspapers today that if we leave without a deal, uh, farmers, and we have lots of them in the West Country, will not be able to export anything into that vast European market for six months. Is that true? Well, first of all, we're working for a good deal, and we're working to ensure we leave with a deal that's a good deal for the whole Is it of the United Kingdom. Most of the no deal, uh, uh, no deal uh, situations are based on the on moving on to a WTO basis for, uh, for tariffs. That's which is not about the ability to actually export, but the conditions under which exports are given. What I think matters more to farmers in the West Country is that we are able to ensure that we get a good deal which enables their products to continue to move across the border into the European Union as seamlessly as possible. That's why we've put forward a proposal for frictionless trade and a free trade area in industrial goods and agricultural products. You know Jacob Rees-Mogg, don't you? Yes. He's very complimentary about you. He says that you are a wonderful Prime Minister, but he says you're spinning with your deal and it's got no hope of going through. The uh, discussions we're having with the European Union are on the basis of coming to a deal with them for the future relationship that we have with the EU. I'm confident that we can get a deal, that we can get a good deal. And crucially, the deal that we've put so on the table... So he's wrong. Well, the, the deal that we've put on the table is a deal that delivers on the vote 
of the British people. It brings an end to free movement. It brings an end to sending vast uh, sums of money annually to the EU. It brings an end to the European Court's jurisdiction. But it does so in a way which protects jobs, protects the union of the United Kingdom, and ensures we have no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Our proposal is the only proposal on the table that delivers on all of those. If the EU has problems with it, have concerns, let's hear what those detailed concerns are. Prime Minister, thank you. That was me in number 10. That was a great experience to be there and feel the atmosphere there. Um, Mrs May, just, she'd just come back from U the United Nations, so she, I mean, she must have been jet-lagged when she did tired, that interview. Yeah. But she's got an extraordinary resilience. Do you, do you see that from the opposition uh, well, yes, benches? Well, yes, but it's never helpful when your own side are trying to do you in. And uh, although she's got this resilience, she's also got a tin ear, and that's the big problem. She doesn't listen to what people are telling her. Chequers is dead. We have to find an alternative. You can't go into negotiation where your existing premise is already dead. So we have to move on from Chequers and see if there's a deal that can be agreed with the EU. But she's got to get a deal with her own party first. What's the thing that you would compromise on then? To try and I get think a deal? what we would look to compromise on is, I mean, clearly the single market. We've already established that uh, the customs unions are given um, because you can't so solve the, 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 you know, the Northern Ireland situation without that. We'll look at some form of relationship and it may well be we have some sort of transitionary arrangement which goes on for some considerable well, like period of time. Years. Well, it could be that that is a relationship we have to look at where the... Uh, I mean, the, we've got the obvious thing with the people's vote. My view is it's the wrong way around. We would look at a relationship okay. and then see where we get to in terms of our long-term outcome with Julie, the EU. I mean, is her message getting across, do you think? Well, I think the message... She, when she speaks in interviews like that, I don't think you really hear anything new at all, and it's just trotting out I there. Think best. Uh, well, I know, I'm well done, <laughs> but I think what she's trying to do is always give the impression that she's strong and she's sticking to her guns. Mm. Actually, that's, that's the wrong thing to do at the moment. What we need is a bit of in, intelligent flexibility, mm. and so I, I don't really understand the tactic. I, I really, really don't. And. I think this whole, it's all moving towards blaming the EU, the EU are too inflexible, we can't do anything with them and I, it would be sad if the public fall for that because that hasn't been the case. All right, uh, we must move on, but you're, you want a, a second referendum, don't you? I do, I think and it's the do, only way to deal with it. The politicians... Our second referendum after we've yeah. got to a stage where we've got mm. something to have a well, referendum with, with on. With all due respect we've... to you from Westminster, Westminster are not capable of dealing with this, they've proven well, that for we, two we, years. Right. We have to Cut them out and first. come back to the people. Okay. Now, uh, West Country farmers have finally been told how the government will support them after Brexit. The new agriculture bill says they'll get money for protecting the environment and not for how much the land that they own. But some are disappointed there's no help for those who produce our food. Here's Amanda Parr. Four generations have farmed this Exmoor land, 120 years, and Dave Knight's family has seen it all. Absolutely love it. I've grown up here. I've worked, my, my working life has all been here. His granddad was here for the 1947 Agriculture Act, with its assured market and guaranteed prices. The changes now being decided upon could be the most significant since that post-war era. The Environment Secretary came to Exmoor recently for ideas much taken with a green Brexit path, he's planned a move away from the current subsidy system based largely on the amount of land farmed and wants to give the lion's share to farmers who support environmental work. It's an approach they've already been working up here, a grand vision for the National Park, where farmers are rewarded for conserving and enhancing the countryside. When the Agriculture Bill draft was released, in amongst some of the sort of guff, uh, the Exmoor Ambition actually got specific mention, uh, which is, is a huge deal because this was a project that really started around the kitchen table. We've worked incredibly hard to do this and, and for such a small national park, we have made a serious amount of noise. It's about creating wildlife habitats, improving air and water quality. For Exmoor farmers, it's their best chance to have a say. We don't think that there will be an Armageddon. There will be massive challenges probably the biggest challenge is around trade. But quite honestly, as farmers and in this area, we're not going to be able to change the trade negotiations. But the areas that we can, principally around that environmental management that he is so keen on and focusing on, 
then actually we're the people to come to. Just challenge the farmers to deal with it and they will deliver that. For farming unions though, there is one glaring omission in the bill. There isn't much about food production. They want to hear more about safeguarding our food supply, improving competitiveness, fairer rewards. Well, I've met Mr Gove and, you know, I haven't got a problem with him, but, I mean, he cares passionately about the environment. He's trying to stamp his foot on it as Mr Environment. Mr Gove, please just listen to us farmers. It's all very well having a lovely green countryside, but, you know, let's just think how we're going to feed this nation. The bill also makes no mention of the bottom-up style funding that currently helps rural economies and communities. Money that built this farm shop and cafe in the Cotswolds. They grow the veg, sell it, cook it and provide a hub bringing people together. To think that it wouldn't be out there for other people like us is a shame really, a real shame. Yeah, I think that if, they, if these sort of grants go um, after Brexit, um, that the, the, the communities will be worse off. This funding is a very small proportion of the total funding that comes from Europe for agriculture. It's less than 5% in England. But the funding has um, a huge leverage value. It's not just the money, it's also the help with thinking about business planning, thinking about how you're going to adapt to changing market conditions, and it's been really valuable up and down the country. The bill goes for its second reading next month. Some already applaud its ambition to put farming hand in hand with a healthy countryside. But for many, a clearer picture of the trading environment in which it will be set is a vital first step. How can we go green, they say, if they're farming in the red? Reminder of just how beautiful the West Country is. Well, lots to talk about there, but let's, before we start talking about where the grants and subsidies might go, let's just talk about if there is no deal. And this uh, statement from the National Farmers Union, which was reported in some papers this week, that if there isn't a deal, farmers might not be able to uh, trade for six months because they'd have third country status. Now, I tried to ask the Prime Minister about that, but I, you know, is, is that, and I didn't get a clear answer, is that true? Is that possible? If there's no deal at all, and you're on WTO rules, it is certainly possible. Um, whether, I, I'm sure that there would be some short-term fudges mm. to make it work, but the farmers are absolutely right to alert everybody to the fact that they're on the front line of this. They, they're creating perishable products, which if they don't get to their markets very quickly, will simply not be saleable and it will fall back. They're the ones who will lose the money. So they're right on the front line. And if you remember, you know, food has got a lot of phytosanitary regulation attached to it. Yeah. And an awful lot of this wrangling over a deal is around regulation. And food is an area where regulation is really key. So if we don't have a deal on that, then I'm afraid they, they really are um, at the front of the queue in terms of harm, immediate harm to their businesses. David? I mean, my worry is that uh, we've obviously got the second reading on the 10th of October. There's lots of good things in the bill. The movement towards environmental support is, is welcome. The problem is, as you know, farmers are saying, it doesn't mention food. It certainly doesn't mention food security, and we need a food strategy. Now, for Farmers Weekly to describe what is happening as close to Munich, now that's a rather an exaggeration, I have to say, but there is something I didn't quite understand what, what, what Well, does that what mean? they're saying is it's a huge sellout. They believe oh, farmers are just so. being sold out because mm. there is this belief that you can put less money into agriculture by smuggling in, if you like, some clever environmental standards and support those standards. We have to support farmers for producing food, it's bottom it, line. The evidence would suggest that farmers voted overwhelmingly in favour of Brexit and presumably uh, knew about this before they, they cast their, their, their vote. And, uh, they were worried about the bureaucracy and the regulations and so on that the EU imposes on them. Surely this is now Britain really taking back control. They won't have to answer to Brussels, they can uh, answer to Westminster, which is what they wanted. Well, I think a lot of them have realised that Westminster will impose just the same. They're not going to give them money for nothing. The idea that if you, you're, you're going to move the funding 
a lot less funding, by the way, because it's very unclear on how much there will be, probably half, but you're going to move the funding from being Brussels rules to Westminster rules. The Westminster rules are going to have to be just... The audit or commission is not going to allow Westminster not to audit, just to give money out. There will be things they will have to do, and in order to know that they've done them, they'll have to fill in bits of paper. I mean, the so things at like... Least, the at least it won't be a one-size-fits-all I mean, for, the, for the entire European Union. It will be well, specific to this well, country. Sorry, I have to correct you. The common agricultural policy is not one-size-fits-all. It is regional. The UK government ha is given, as is every other government, a suite of options, and it chooses the one it wants. I mean, the real worry is that we cannot replace a European control of agriculture with one that is controlled by the US or Australasia. I mean, I was told categorically right at the beginning by the NFU that if Michael Gove thinks that cheap food deals with the US or Australasia are acceptable to British farmers, he has to think again. That would wipe out British agriculture. We're, we're already producing far too low a level of our own food. We need to get up to about 80% self-sufficient. That's a 20% increase. And what we're faced with is if we have these cheap imports coming in, it will wipe out British agriculture. We have to well, why get did real they, about why that. did, If that's true, why did farmers vote for Brexit? They voted because they thought they would get a different regulatory regime. What were they expecting? But they, well, I think they were expecting more of well, a British-led I mean, agricultural very, system. Farmers are very, they're very smart business people, aren't they? Well, they are, but they are, can only work on a level uh, playing field. And the fact is, there is no level playing field with the US. The US massively subsidises its agriculture. We're taking on that without any protection at all. That would be catastrophic for British agriculture. Is there any Farmers sign know that, that the government will do that? Why would they do that? Oh, absolutely. I think David is right. And, of course, you just, just listen to Liam Fox, listen to Boris Johnson. They're talking about exactly that, a special relationship. With the U.S., when it does trade deals, talk to anyone who's done a trade deal with the U.S. Talk to the Canadians who are in, you know, bound up with them. Mm. The one thing they make sure is that their farmers and their agricultural production comes top of the list of the advantages they get. Okay. And, and they we cannot so fight that. We, gotta, we are we, much we gotta, too small. Let, we've got to go because we've got to take a look back at the week in uh, 60 seconds. One of the South West's Euro MPs resigned from UKIP this week. William Dartmouth said the party had become homophobic and anti-Islamic under leader Gerard Batten. He'll now sit as an independent. A homeless shelter in a residential part of Bristol was approved by the council, despite hundreds of objections from local people. But we are going to have a 24-7 uh, a place for people to go to, to be off the cold streets of Bristol uh, this winter and we're going to have it in place and, and I think that should be celebrated. Councillors in Gloucester unveiled the latest plans for King's Square. It would still have live events, also a stage, big screen and water feature. The public are being asked their views. And from Nailsworth to the United Nations. Forest Green Rovers owner Dale Vince addressed the UN this week to tell how it's become the world's first carbon-neutral vegan club. They'll all be eating hummus in the morning. Yeah, still unbeaten, I'm told. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah, OK, that's all from us for now. My thanks to my guests, Julie Gerling and David Drew. I'll see you again next Sunday from all of us here. Bye-bye. Take care.